we have got uh, the Satrix CI CIO this, uh, this evening to do our presentation. I'm going to be talking international uh, investing. It's Kingsley Williams. Perfect. Thank you. Um, good evening. All right. So, yeah, the title of uh, this evening's presentation is uh, What It Means to Invest Globally Locally, um, hosted by the JSC Power Hour. And uh, we're really going to, uh, you know, unpack what the uh, range of investment opportunities are in the global landscape, particularly from an equity perspective. Firstly, uh, Satrix Managers is a registered and approved manager in collective investment schemes in securities and is an authorized financial services provider in terms of phase. Now, let's understand what uh, the range of um, strategies or, or, you know, how to contextualize the, you know, equities within a global context. Uh, we're, we're firstly dealing with a, a significantly large universe. And I just want to try and put that in context for you and also to contextualize how some of the indices that you'll come across capturing various parts of the global equity universe, uh, you know, how those fit together, uh, you know, how you should understand where those uh, fit in relative to, to any other option that uh, you may be presented with. So let's start with developed markets. And by developed markets, I mean countries that typically have higher per capita GDP than you would find in countries like South Africa. These would be countries like uh, the United States, Canada, uh, the UK, most of Western Europe, um, you know, Australia, Japan, etc. So these are all countries that are known as developed economies. And the index that most often captures what uh, you know, developed equity markets are doing is referred to as MSCI World. The number that I've put underneath MSCI World uh, is actually the number of securities within that index. And, uh, you know, so you can see that over, over 1,600 companies represented in that index. You'll also notice that MSCI World is made up of both large and medium sized companies. So index providers generally classify uh, the size of companies that make up their index, you know, whether it's large, medium, or small. Um, and so when you refer to MSCI World, it includes both large and mid cap companies. Now, S&P 500 is also a very common index that you'll come across. And as the name suggests, uh, it includes just 500 companies uh, within the, you know, within the global, or within the, within the US market. So it's also limited to only large cap companies. So large cap companies within the US. Now the US actually makes up about 64% currently of MSCI world. So you can see that the US really dominates developed markets globally. Um, and the S&P 500 rep would obviously represent a significant portion of that. Another index uh, that you'll often hear quoted is the NASDAQ. Um, I'm going to refer specifically to the NASDAQ 100, which is not exactly the same as the full NASDAQ index. The full NASDAQ index will represent all companies listed on the NASDAQ exchange. Now, the NASDAQ exchange is an exchange in the US, but the NASDAQ 100 specifically limits uh, the number of companies to that index to the largest 100 listed on the NASDAQ exchange. And very importantly, it excludes financial companies that may be listed on the NASDAQ exchange. So it will be anything but financials. So you can think of it almost like a, a new world Dow Jones index. The Dow Jones index is an, in, uh, you know, an industrial index, uh, but a lot of the companies that list on the NASDAQ exchange tend to be innovative new world uh, type businesses. So you can think of the NASDAQ 100 as a, as a, you know, a new Dow Jones index uh, because it doesn't include any financials. You'll notice that it is also limited to large cap companies as well. Now, broadening this out, uh, you know, looking beyond developed markets, you then move into the emerging market space. Now, the first thing you'll notice is that within MSCI emerging markets, there are about 1,400 companies, so almost as many as you'll find across developed markets. But interestingly, uh, emerging markets, you know, relative to the combined total of developed and emerging, only makes up about uh, 11 to 12 percent of the market cap across those two sets. So 
the companies across emerging markets are a lot smaller than their developed market peers. And I'll unpack that for you a bit later on. Uh, emerging markets also include large and mid cap companies uh, like developed markets and MSCI world does. Uh, so those two, if you then combine these two indices, developed and emerging markets, in MSCI terminology or parlance, you'll get, uh, you'll, you'll come across this term called all country world index or ACWI, A-C-W-I. So that represents the union of those two investable subsets. I'm going to just show you where South Africa fits in. So it is deemed an emerging market. And I'm looking at the all share index specifically in that it, it has about 153 stocks in it currently. In fact, at the end of this week, that's going to drop down to about 151 when it rebalances. So you can see a far smaller universe of companies to invest in than you can find uh, globally. In fact, uh, South Africa within uh, emerging markets makes up only about 4% uh, of the investable opportunity set within emerging markets. And if you look at South Africa within the, 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 the all country world index, it makes up about half a percent of that investable universe. Finally, I'm going to add the small cap companies and you'll see there are in fact many more companies that are classified as small companies relative to their large and medium sized companies. But as a proportion of the total, uh, they, they're much, uh, you know, represent a much smaller subset of the entire universe. Um, when you combine large, mid and small cap companies together uh, from an MSCI terminology perspective, they'll add this uh, investable market index or IMI suffix to the name of the index. So if you see an index that's got IMI or investable market index on the end of it, it means that includes large, medium and small size companies uh, in, you know, within, a, within the way it's made up. So in total across the developed uh, or, or across this entire investable equity universe, there are close on 9,000 stocks uh, that make up the all country world index investable market or all country world investable market index. And so one question that you should probably be asking yourself is, well, where do I even begin? With so much choice, you know, it's difficult enough knowing you know, which investment to make on the JSC where you have 153 stocks to choose, uh, let alone having to contend with 9,000 different securities across a range of different countries. Hopefully we're gonna make that job a little bit easier for you this evening. So Satrix offers uh, products and funds that uh, offer exposure to all of the indices I've shown you. Um, and investing locally in RANDs through an exchange traded fund or unit trust is really the most hassle free way to invest offshore. If you need to uh, you know, withdraw any of the capital you've invested, you'll typically have your money within one to three days, depending on the vehicle and platform you've invested through. And you don't need to deal with any of the admin and hassle of getting currency offshore, not to mention the costs involved of doing that. Uh, nor having to worry about opening an offshore account, dealing with offshore tax implications, and the list goes on. But, uh, you know, just, just going through the list, uh, MSCI World, across developed markets, we offer in, in ETF, unit trust, and uh, USITS form. USITS funds are offshore domiciled funds, so those you would have to invest, uh, you know, you'd have to take currency offshore and get, ex get exchange control approval to do that, and open an account offshore to do that. So I'm really going to focus on the ETFs and the unit trusts, which are available in South African RANDs. Uh, emerging markets is also available as a USITS, uh, but then we do offer emerging markets IMI. So there you see that IMI suffix. That means it offers exposure to large, medium, and small size companies as an ETF. And then also the US markets, both the S&P 500 and NASDAQ 100 are available as ETFs here in South Africa, which trade on the JSE. Now, it is claimed, Einstein said, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. And he who understands it, earns it, while he who doesn't, pays it. Uh, now, associating a finance quote with Einstein, obviously, and conveniently places those in the investment and finance industry in the company of an undeniable genius, which undoubtedly gives those in the finance industry way too much credit. I'm sure you'll agree. That said, compounding is powerful, so let's understand why. 
question I'm going to pose is what difference does two to two and a half percent make? So it turns out quite a lot. Two to two and a half percent is the average dividend yield of these two indices. And over a 21 year period, it's the difference between doubling, i.e. going from 100 to 200 by not reinvesting dividends as shown in the chart on the left, versus tripling your money going from 100 to 300 by reinvesting dividends, as I'm showing you on the chart on the right. So same index, very different outcomes, depending on whether you reinvest your dividends or your fund distributions. So often ETFs will distribute um, you know, once a quarter or on, 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 on some sort of schedule. It's very important that you do reinvest those dividends because over the long term, it makes a material difference to your final outcome. So please make sure that you do that. I'm only going to consider total returns, i.e. dividends reinvested in the subsequent slides I'm going to show you. I'm only going to look at total return indices. I'd also just like to explain uh, the, the charts that I'm going to show you here. So these are actually log scale charts. You'll notice on each grid line, uh, the value doubles. So it's a log to base two. Um, and what that means is that you know, the value of the index, if it moves from one grid line to the other, is either halving in value or doubling in value, say from here to here. And it's important to show cumulative charts like this because of compounding. Uh, because if you don't, what it tends to, or what, what happens is the movements later on in the chart tend to be, you know, visually appear larger than earlier movements in the chart and earlier on in the period. With a log scale chart, the magnitude of the move appears the same, regardless of whether you're earlier on in the period or later on in the period. So that's why I've used log scale charts. And it also helps to understand the relative performance between different strategies through time. Firstly, let's understand uh, what we're looking at in terms of the NASDAQ 100 index in US dollar terms. All of the series I'm going to show you on this chart are in dollars. Now, I'm not sure if any of you can remember the tech bubble, but the NASDAQ 100 was probably most exposed to it bursting. I had, in fact, just started working and was based in New York City during this time. And the tech bubble burst and continued unraveling the following year in 2001 when I was in London. And 9-11 didn't help markets either. You remember the Twin Towers going down in the US. Markets recovered slightly, but ultimately continued falling for another year post 9-11 until they found a bottom in September 2002 over here. So the NASDAQ from its peak over here to its low in September 2002 lost over 80% of its value, which is a staggering, a staggering uh, outcome. Looking at the S&P 500 and MSCI World, which are broader indices, you know, they fared better over that period, but still lost almost half their value over that time. Four years later, and all the losses had been undone until we were then faced with a global financial crisis, which struck as the over-leveraged housing market ripped through the banking industry and financial markets, which again lost more than, more than half of their value over this period here while the real economy slumped and job losses mounted. Intermonetary stimulus, or quantitative easing as it's, be as it's become known, and post that we've actually experienced one of the longest bull markets in history. The US has done particularly well over this period with the S&P 500 catching up and surpassing developed markets. You can see the red line surpassing the blue, mar uh, the blue line, which is MSCI World. While large cap and growth stocks, which you know, the NASDAQ 100 would capture quite, uh, you know, would be a good proxy for that, for those types of investment strategies, has even outperformed those, uh, outperformed small and value stocks. So resulting in the NASDAQ 100 significantly outperforming the broader US market. You can see it started significantly lower than the S&P 500 over here, but has ended up significantly higher uh, at the end of this period, which is May, at the end of May 2020. Now, perhaps surprisingly, emerging markets have done even better over this entire period relative to developed markets. And this has been largely due to their, uh, their performance prior to the global financial crisis, as developed markets have outperformed since then, with the gap narrowing. So 
you can see the outperformance from uh, emerging markets here, but emerging markets sort of tending to drift largely sideways post the global financial crisis, while developed markets have continued to go up. What is most surprising though, is how South Africa in dollar terms, so in other words, I've taken out uh, you know, any currency issues, everything's in common currency here, uh, has in fact, over this long period, outperformed them all. Again, largely due to phenomenal performance prior to the global financial crisis over here. And this is still despite our depreciating currency, as well as the largely sideways moves we've had in our local market, um, essentially since, uh, since the recovery of the global financial crisis. Since then, we've really moved sideways from a local equity market perspective. I'm gonna add one final series, which is now how the dollar has performed relative to the rand. So think of exchanging rands for $100 back in March 1999 over here. This is what those $100 would be worth in rands through time. And what you'll notice is that the rand tends to weaken during financial distress, but then tends to recover again as global equity markets recover. You can see that occurring over here. Again, during the global financial crisis, the rand blew out and then recovered again and sort of resumes its longward, longward trend. We had it weaken again over here in 2016, 2015, 2016, and then significant weakness again, which we all should be fresh in our memories uh, with the COVID-19 lockdown. Um, so over this entire period, it has weakened relative to the dollar on average uh, by just over 5% per annum. And right now the RAND is considered to be very undervalued. So there is a good chance it could strengthen from its, its oversold levels, as has happened in the past. And in fact, it has started to do since the end of April. You can see that on the chart here with it starting to recover here. So if your long-term plan is to have offshore exposure, these periods of RAND strength obviously do present uh, good buying opportunities to enter global markets. I'm gonna shift that chart to the left now. Um, and create the same chart with the international returns in RANDs on the right. So that's what I'm plotting here on the right. Converting this performance uh, on the left into RANDs on the right. And this is done by basically multiplying the index performance of each of these dollar return series by the uh, exchange rate, which is the black line, to get the performance in RANDs. And over this 21 year period, these indices have increased between eight and 15 times. In other words, you would have multiplied your money eight to 15 times, depending on which index you've been invested in. With an average annual return, ranging from 10 and a half to 14% per annum. Now, it's important to mention that this is before costs, uh, because you cannot invest directly in an index. You can track an index, but you can't invest directly in an index. Um, you know, any investment, uh, any investment strategy will have costs associated with it. But, you know, those returns are quite a, quite a staggering result um, over that period of time. So whether in dollars or in rands, what's also interesting to note is that the South African equity market has outperformed all these indices over this long period of time. However, despite the amazing returns over this long period of time, as humans, we are very prone to what we call recency bias and emotions tend to take over in the midst of turmoil as we've been through during the last few months. That said, looking at shorter period returns can be useful to understand the consistency of your investment experience, as well as highlight other shorter term risks. So I'm going to look at rolling three year returns on this chart. So just to illustrate uh, each, each dot on this chart represents the previous three years worth of returns. So our first point will occur in March 2002 because we needed the first three years from March 1999 to plot that first uh, annualized return over that period. And uh, I'm only going to show dots on the NASDAQ, but each series represents the same thing. In other words, each point on the chart represents the prior three years uh, average return. So three years is probably too short a period to review any equity investment, and particularly when there is additional currency risk involved. 
And this is quite clearly illustrated by the magnitude and length of time that a three-year return can deliver or has delivered a negative outcome, particularly on the international indices. So you'll notice this period here where these lines were below, below the zero line here. This represents sustained negative returns on a three-year basis uh, for a prolonged period of time. And if you remember the previous charts I showed you, this, was, this coincided with the RAND uh, strengthening and recovering post it weakening uh, during the, um, the, the dot-com crash. So what's also interesting looking at this chart and particularly the all share index is that over, you know, looking at three year returns, it has only delivered a negative return once, i.e. for one month uh, over this entire period. And that actually occurred in March 2020 with the COVID-19 lockdown and the massive uncertainty that hit uh, global markets. And obviously with our returns already being relatively low, we then dropped into negative territory, but it was just for one month and we've bounced back into positive territory again since then on a three year basis. So obviously you can also see with this chart that there have been sustained and significantly higher returns coming from developed markets relative to our local market. But again, just to reiterate, be aware of the risk of investing offshore, particularly when the RAND strengthens because you can then experience negative returns on those offshore investments in RANDs. I'm going to turn attention now to the uh, constituents of the developed uh, market indices. So these are the 20 largest constituents according to MSCI. And I've plotted uh, you know, the country that these uh, companies are based or domiciled in or listed in as well as the sector they operate in. Uh, the size of these companies, you can see there are three companies that are over, you know, over, uh, over a billion dollars, sorry, over a trillion dollars, if you look at those, um, those numbers there. Um, the, and then you'll have the weights that these companies represent within these different indices. Now, I've plotted at the bottom of this chart what the weight of the 20 largest companies is within each of these indices. I'm not showing the 20 largest companies within all three, uh, just the 20 largest as per MSCI. But you'll see that as the universe narrows, the weights uh, with, you know, within these indices goes up. So Apple has a higher weight in S&P 500 than it does within MSCI World, and a much higher weight within the NASDAQ 100 relative to S&P 500 or MSCI World. And as such, the top 20 weight or what the, what the top 20 companies within an index sum to tends to get higher, the more concentrated the index. <clears throat> now, I'd just like you to run through this list though, because although this list is dominated by US companies, the reality is that these are global companies serving customers around the world, even though the company is classified as a US company. Just run through the list quickly and count how many companies you're not sure if you've ever dealt with or whether you're using any of their products uh, currently or in the past. If I work through this list from the bottom, I count, you know, AT&T, Verizon, Roche Sales Medicines, which I've probably used, Home Depot, Berkshire Hathaway, United Health Group, and maybe JP Morgan are the only companies I don't think I would have dealt with directly. Um, but possibly deal with without knowing it. So essentially all of the others, 75% of the companies in this list, you know, I've probably had direct interactions with or consumed their products at one point or another. You know, if you're using WhatsApp, you're, you're using Facebook. We all use Google on a daily basis. That's Alphabet. Uh, if you own an Apple device, you're using their products. So um, it really speaks to the global nature of these companies, even though the country that they classified as being listed and domiciled in is the US. Now, Tesla is very topical at the moment. And uh, according to MSCI, it is actually the largest car company on a free float market cap basis and ranks as the 39th largest company globally ahead of Toyota, which is now the 45th lar largest company and the second largest motor manufacturer. And this is as at the 16th of June. 
S and P five hundred, interestingly, even though Tesla is a U.S. company and is a large company, S and P five hundred has no exposure to Tesla because their index has a requirement for the company to be profitable for a year before they are included. Tesla is, is, however, the 13th largest company within the NASDAQ 100. So it tells you that it is listed on the NASDAQ exchange. Now, what's really interesting is Tesla has yet to make an annual profit, let alone distribute any dividends to investors. Um, in, its last, you know, in, in, in the last quarter, the first quarter of 2020, it made 103,000 vehicles. While Toyota, on the other hand, uh, made uh, 2.4 million vehicles in the first quarter. Toyota also obviously generates profits. Uh, it trades on a price earnings ratio of eight times. So that means if it continues to deliver the same profits that it, uh, you know, that it's last reported, you would essentially get your earnings back over eight years uh, from your initial investment. And it has a dividend yield of 2.8%. So this, speaks, this really speaks to the way markets work and function. You know, their price and expectations, sometimes those expectations can be unrealistic and chase growth opportunities, as evidenced by Tesla, which currently generates no profits, but it's trading on expectations of future growth. The heady days of the dot-com bubble come to mind when looking at this example. Although, at least in the case of Tesla, they are actually making something, which wasn't always the case with companies trading on exorbitant multiples 20 years ago. This is also the challenge with markets in that there can often be an inverse relationship between historic realized returns, in other words, the meteoric rise we've seen with Tesla, versus the future expected returns. We don't know whether Tesla is going to continue to be a great investment. So looking back at what a company, you know, how it's performed historically can sometimes be dangerous. Deciding whether to invest in Tesla now is an incredibly difficult decision, particularly when its CEO is successfully launching manned missions to the International Space Station. I'm not sure how many of you watched the, the Falcon rocket uh, launch the Dragon capsule with, uh, you know, from American soil with astronauts for the first time in nine years. Um, you know, and there's a plan to, to ultimately uh, get astronauts back to the moon and a longer term vision of getting, getting the human race to Mars. So you know, when, when you see all of that, it's difficult not to be excited. But a safer bet, and certainly this is the approach I follow, is to get exposure to global investment opportunities by tracking a broad market index such as MSCI World the results of which are shown on an after-cost basis relative to any other global general equity fund available in South Africa. In this particular case, I'm using our unit trust feeder fund, uh, but you could you know, you'd experience a very similar result with our ETFs. And what this shows you is that it makes for a compelling investment and avoids all the selection risk of choosing a particular fund or a manager. As the stats show, particularly if you look over five years, our MSCI World Equity Feeder Fund was the seventh best performing fund out of 35 funds. It outperformed 80% of the funds that are available as an investment strategy uh, in our local market. And, you know, this is just tracking MSCI World. You get the full investable universe and you don't need to then make that difficult decision of whether Tesla is a good investment or not now. You're going to get exposure to it, but you're also going to have exposure to the likes of Toyota and VW and all of the other motor companies that it includes. So it really gives you greater peace of mind. Moving on to emerging markets, um, similar, similar table I'm showing you here. And what, you'll no what you may notice is that uh, the largest three companies within emerging markets, as indicated by the market cap size here, actually rank within the largest 20 of developed markets. So in other words, these three companies are larger than the 20th largest company within developed markets. So these are significant contributors to global equity market performance and therefore can't be ignored. What I've also plotted is the uh, weights of uh, any South African companies within the All Share Index. And obviously only NASPAS shows up in this list. Uh, and 
but it appears as if South Africa is somewhat underrepresented in this list. What, what this list doesn't show is the next five largest companies within the All Share Index, which are in fact actually classified as developed market companies from an MSCI perspective. And this is because they have their primary listing in the UK, Switzerland, the Netherlands, etc. These would be companies like BHP Group, Richmond, Anglo-American Process, which recently got spun out of NASPAS, and British American Tobacco. All of these companies are actually available within the JSC All Share Index, um, and it speaks to the global diversification that even investing in our local equity market offers. While they don't show up on this list, they are available should you be tracking you know, an index like the top 40 or, or any other broad market index available in South Africa. Um, what you also might be concerned by is that the weight of the largest 20 companies and how high that is for, for the All Share Index at 73%. But uh, this is also not unusual for smaller markets. Even large markets like Switzerland, uh, their largest three companies, which were on the previous list, uh, Nestle, Roche, and Novartis, make up over 50% of their local market, whereas it takes six companies within the JSC to reach a similar degree of coverage. So seeing this kind of high degree of concentration is not unusual uh, within smaller markets such as our own, particularly where you do have uh, global companies listed on that exchange. I'm going to, to end off now and uh, give you an opportunity to ask some questions. But before I do that, um, you, you might be puzzled with you know, what to invest in uh, or, or which index to invest in and uh, when to do that, uh, you know, is now the right time to invest. And I came across this quote uh, at the beginning of this year made by David Booth. He runs uh, a very well-known uh, asset management firm in the US, and he was writing to his investors pre-lockdown, pre-COVID-19. And I think this rings true now as much as it did then. We'll never know when the best time to get into the market is because we can't predict the future. And if you think about it, that makes sense. If the market's doing its job, prices ought to be set at a level where you experience some form of anxiety. It's unrealistic to think the market would ever offer an obvious time to get in. If it did, there would be no risk and no reward. And one of the simplest yet highly effective ways, most effective ways to approach equity investing is to invest in a disciplined and regular way, often referred to as RAND cost or dollar cost averaging. Trying to time markets, the currency, and whether one index is more attractive than another at a particular point in time requires a lot of work and may lead you to saving less than would be the case if you steadily invest on a monthly basis. So I'm going to leave you with that thought and thank you for your time and uh, open it up to Simon to again uh, on, you know, uh, field any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Kingsley. Some, some some awesome data and stats that came through. I, I am a data nerd. That was, that was great. A uh, couple of questions coming in. Uh, the first, Kingsley, it's Tuba around your S&P 500 fund. Uh, the first question is, it's a feeder fund. What does the feeder part mean? And then the second question is, uh, it doesn't pay any distributions. Can you clarify how that works? Okay, great question. So, yeah, a feeder fund means uh, the fund we offer and which you buy into ultimately feeds into another fund. Um, and that fund is actually an iShares fund listed, listed offshore. So our fund feeds into a, uh, an iShares ETF listed in the UK. Uh, so that's why it's a feeder fund. Um, and the reason it doesn't pay any distributions is because the iShares ETF that we hold reinvests those for you. So you don't need to ever worry about reinvesting your, uh, your dividends. That gets done for you. It runs on a total return basis. Yeah, so in essence, your dividends are being automatically put back into the, the, the ETF rather than us having to do it manually. Exactly, exactly. A great question from Shane. It's investors usually have a home country bias. Shane, absolutely investors do the world over. What should an investor look to invest in home countries versus global equity? Uh, I'm going to give, give a quick thought, and Kingsley, if you've got some added on to it. Uh, Shane, also, I mean, obviously we have the, 
the our, our pension and provident funds, which are Regulation 28, uh, which you know mm-hmm. cap the offshore property exposure. So t- pr- offshore rather and property exposure. So our investments usually are very South African focused. And if we take the view that South Africa as a percentage of global GDP is, I don't know, half a percent, a little bit less, as an individual, we are typically overexposed to a single country. Now it's South Africa, we love it, we don't want to be anywhere else. The way I manage it is my discretionary, particularly my tax-free investing, I then put into an offshore ETF uh, via the, the, the JSC to try and dilute some of that uh, uh, home country bias that, that certainly we and, and other countries around the world. I saw data out of Australia, and it's pretty much the same for Australians. They're, they're overweight to Australia because it's, it's the country they know and understand. Uh, Kingsley, thoughts on, on home country bias? No, that's it. That's absolutely right. And, uh, you know, because of, you know, you've already touched on it, you know, your pension savings, or if you're saving through an RA or Provident Fund or any vehicle like that, which enjoys uh, the, you know, tax benefits, then you're confined to, as you mentioned, Regulation 28, which limits the amount of offshore exposure that you can, that you can take advantage of. But in the discretionary world, where it's your own additional savings over and above that, you know, you, you, you first want to max out your tax-free savings. And once you've done that, if there's still more that you want to invest, you then, you, you're, you're not confined in terms of what you invest that in. So definitely, uh, you know, going the way that you've suggested of utilizing your discretionary savings to gain additional offshore exposure makes a lot of sense. Uh, just be aware, though, that there will be times particularly when the RAND does strengthen, uh, that those offshore investment strategies may underperform a, uh, a local uh, strategy, uh, which, you know, investors in, in the JSC, for example, um, because you're taking that additional currency risk. Uh, but if you're investing for the long term and you're expecting, you know, the long term trend of the RAND to continue weakening relative to the dollar and other developed market currencies, then um, that's not not you know not a bad route to go. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, you mentioned 99. I, I was in the markets at that point. I remember the rand peaked at uh, 1360, uh, and then in, in, in uh, it was a 2000 December, and then strengthened all the way down to five rand 75, and it took a lot of the shine off the the your your offshore investments over, over the decades it all shakes out, but in the shorter term, um, it can yep. get a little bit crazy. Uh, and it can be, it, it can, it, it's a little hard to, to, to manage at times from an emotional perspective. Question, is it, is it wise to invest in both NASDAQ 100 and MSCI World? Kingsley, there will be some overlap, uh, you, the slide yep. that you illustrated on that, but there will also, because of the, the sort of breadth of MSCI World, there will also be a, a fair bit of, of, of companies in the MSCI world that simply don't exist in the NASDAQ. So you will get uh, a lot more by merging those two. Yeah, you essentially, um, you're going overweight uh, or taking an additional view on the US and in particular uh, non-financial companies, as well as companies that are more sort of focused on the tech slash new economy Part of the market. Uh, I mean, that's really what the NASDAQ 100 gives you. It is sort of often thought of as being a very growth focused index uh, and does attract uh, newer, more innovative type companies to its exchange. So, uh, you know, if, if you think those are the companies which are really going to be tomorrow's winners and tomorrow's largest companies, then by investing in the, you know, by having a, you know, investing in the Nasdaq 100, you're, you're essentially taking a view that that these are companies that are going to continue to grow into the future. Uh, but you will get exposure to those same companies within MSCI World. MSCI World will capture all of them um, as well, uh, but obviously in a much lower weighting than what you would find within Nasdaq 100. So just to be aware that if you invest in Nasdaq 100, you're taking quite a specific view on the types of companies that that index represents. The, also something worth mentioning is that, you know, Tesla was a case in point. 
uh, those companies can often tend to be quite expensive when you look at it through a valuation lens. In other words, uh, you know, the likes of Tesla is the most valuable motor company in the world, yet it hasn't uh, uh, pay, you know, delivered an annual profit yet. So, you know, that's an extreme example, but many of the companies in the NASDAQ 100 are often, you know, new economies, very innovative companies in the early stages of their growth cycle. Some of them may, may not survive. They may not make it. Yeah. Uh, they, they may not get their business model to work. Um, but, you know, if you're prepared to take that additional risk, there, there can often be handsome rewards, as has been the case in the uh, economic environment that we've had since the global financial crisis. But these things do go in, in cycles. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Devendra, you're asking, can you do a global fund in a tax-free account? Uh, if you mean in global fund in, in terms of, for example, the, the Satrix MSCI or NASDAQ or something, absolutely you can. Uh, so you can put that into a local tax-free account. Brandon, you're asking how many shares listed globally? It's about 10,000. And you're talking, you ask around investable. Um, you know, JC's got 370 shares, about 160 investable. It, it's partly size of the company. It's also partly liquidity. In other words, how much uh, value is traded per day. But also that investable level is very much for fund managers who are, you know, they're investing in, in tens, hundreds of millions, in some cases, in literally billions of rands. Uh, for me and you, well, I don't know you, maybe you, you've got the billions too. For me, you know, for me, Investable is a, a company doing a couple of hundred thousand rand per day. That's Investable in my world because I, I can go much deeper into the liquidity because I've got a much smaller portfolio. So the investability then becomes in some sense is less of an issue as your portfolio is smaller. And then of course, as your portfolio grows in time, uh, that becomes a, a, a bit more of a, of a risk issue. Um, a question, and I can't remember where it came from, uh, talking around dividends, Kingsley, I mean, particularly if you look at something like the MSCI world, you know, across a multitude different countries, all got the different dividend taxes, et cetera. In, in, in a simple layman's term, how does that all shake out to somebody ultimately receiving that dividend in South Africa? Yeah, so um, it's, it's quite an interesting uh, point because the fund that we feed into is actually Irish domicile. So the tax gotcha. that gets applied mm -hmm. to the dividends that the companies uh, that we hold uh, is, is, is based on whatever withholding tax rate is applicable to an Irish investor because that's where the fund is domiciled. Um, but essentially, you don't need to worry about that from a, from a South African perspective because the fund itself actually doesn't distribute anything. So it's all reinvested uh, you know, in, the, in the price of the underlying fund that we hold. So uh, also, the index that we report performance against uh, deals with the withholding tax uh, applicable to, you know, uh, you know, applicable to those companies. So you're essentially seeing uh, the performance of the index aligned with what you're going to actually receive on a total return basis through that fund. I'm not sure if that answers the question. No, that's perfect. Absolutely, it does. Anthony, you're asking, would you max out your 27.5%? Uh, or 350,000, whichever is smaller, to Provident Fund, after maxing your tax-free, uh, before investing offshore. There's, I mean, we, this is what we like to call an Excel spreadsheet answer. Oftentimes, the, 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 you know, crunch the hard numbers. Um, when I crunched it for, you know, my sense was that the, the tax-free was better first because you can spend that money so much later. There's, there's no requirement to, to convert it into an annuity or anything. So you can leave it until you're you know, 80, 90, 100 or something like that. But of course, in many cases, your work environment is also going to be paying into a provident or pension or something like that. Um, so it really is going to depend on, on, on individuals and the circumstances. Uh, Shingi, you asked, why is that emerging currencies are weakening against the US dollar? It affects the rand. For example, Turkish lira weakened against the dollar, uh, SA Rand also weakened. Uh, what we see is our currency is incredibly liquid. In other words, a lot of transactional value going through. So if you're an investor sitting in, in Paris or, 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 or London or New York, and you want to take a position on emerging market currencies, 
oftentimes, rather than trade a basket, you just go trade the South African Rand and you will broadly get that emerging market exposure. It does make our currency volatile and it often means events happening in other emerging markets sort of bubble over and, and, and come into, in, in, into our currency. Ultimately, it's, it shakes out, but uh, you know, it, 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 we, we live in that global environment these days and there's pros and there's cons to it. Uh, Kingsley Rubin asks, you said of ETFs that pay uh, monthly dividends offshore, uh, does Satrix have any monthly dividends? Ours are typically quarterly or biannual in South Africa, am I correct? Yeah, our, our ETFs are locally listed or our ETFs um, offering local equity market exposure distribute on a quarterly basis. Most of them distribute on a quarterly basis. Mm -hmm. uh, unit trusts tend to be semi-annual, uh, so twice a year. Um, but all of the international uh, funds, international ETFs that we have, uh, those uh, run on a total return basis uh, or are essentially accumulating and therefore don't distribute. The, any underlying dividends are reinvested. Yeah, good point. Uh, Mark, you're commenting that concerns you about investing only in the S&P 500 and even to a degree emerging market, a global uh, limited in terms of exposure to property and natural resources. Agreed on that. There are uh, offshore property ETFs that solve that problem. We see the same in the, the top 40. It, it's got some property, but typically it's fairly light on a property. Uh, and resources obviously is, is you know, predominantly going to be your South American, Latin American, uh, some Africa, some Australian. Um, and then we can start getting clever with our, with our, 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 our ETF portfolios and perhaps add a little bit of extra um, EM exposure to get some, some, some resources and certainly some global uh, property to get some there as well. Mabusa, um, you're asking, would investing in a feeder fund ultimately remove the need to invest in the underlying fund? Uh, Mabusa, absolutely it does. So you, you mentioned the, you know, would you also need to invest in the iShare? No, if you've got the, 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 the feeder, the, the fund that feeds into it on the JSC, you're getting that exposure that the feeder fund would give you. If you went and also bought the fund that, that's feeding into it, you would be essentially duplicating uh, exposure. Brendan, why are certain companies excluded from the top 40? For example, ABN Bev. Uh, Brendan, inward listed companies need to have a certain level of South African registered shareholders for in order for them to be included in the top 40. If memory serves, I think it's 5%. And in a company the size of ABM Bev, which trades in multiple different markets, it's big in our market, but uh, less than 5% of its uh, float is on the JSC. So ABM Bev, uh, Glencore is another one that also has uh, uh, not in our indices as a result of that. Um, you know, you're asking what I think will happen to the czar in the next six months. I'm going to reference you back to the quote that, that Kingsley and dodged that question. I think we could go stronger, but over longer term, we will, over the longer term, it goes weaker. But short term predictions on currency is exceedingly difficult. Um, uh, Kingsley, a question from Peter: relative benefits or disbenefits of going ETF versus unit trust? We've obviously been talking ETFs; they JSC traded, unit trusts trading via list platforms. A quick highlight of terms of benefits, or, or, or is it broadly you're going to get the same return, really? Yeah, I, I, I don't have the chart with me, unfortunately, in the slide deck. But um, you know, both our MSCI World Feeder Unit Trust, as well as our MSCI uh, World ETF, uh, which is also a feeder fund into the iShares ETF offshore, um, through time give you. A uh, very very similar outcome. So I guess it's just a question of which uh, investment strategy is more convenient. Uh, you want to have a look at the cost differences because the way that the funds are structured, uh, some you know unit trusts can very often need to incur additional costs to be able to provide that to you know that fund to the end investor relative to an ETF. So you'll often find that an ETF can be priced more cost effectively from a total expense ratio perspective. Uh, but of course, there are other costs that you need to be aware of when accessing these TFs, you know, what is your brokerage rate that you're trading at, the spreads of getting in and out of the ETF. So a lot will also depend on how active you are as an investor within each of those vehicles. So it becomes quite complicated to, to make a decision. And I think 
in the end, it boils down to what's most convenient for you. Yeah, great answer. Devendra, you're asking around the fourth industrial revolution uh, uh, ETF. It's the Signia product. Um, go delve into it. It's a lot less pure tech than you think. If you look at the, the different tech ETFs, offshore tech ETFs on the JSC, the fourth industrial is actually the lightest of the four. Um, and, and that's not, not necessarily a bad thing, but you know, in times it's had a lot of, of, of uh, uh, sort of weapon manufacturers. At one point, uh, GoPro was the largest holding um, in, in the fund. So go and delve into not so much the companies, but the minimum disclosure documents that you'll get off the website will give you a sense of the industries that it is then operating into. Uh, Kingsley, I was asking around uh, it spreads particularly sometimes a bit wider, sometimes a bit uh, narrower. What determines a market maker's spread when they're operating on the JSC? Yeah, so uh, this is a question we get quite often and the, there's no simple answer, unfortunately, because the spread is going to be a function of firstly, what the, un, you know, what the ETF is made up of. So, you know, if it's made up of emerging market stocks versus developed market stocks, that's immediately going to widen the spreads because emerging market stocks tend to have wider spreads than their developed market peers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, that's the first point. Uh, similarly, if it's based on, um, for example, the NASDAQ 100, which is a relatively uh, small index with only 100 constituents, the costs of implementing and tracking that index should, you know, should be lower than tracking uh, an index across emerging markets with more countries and wider spreads, as well as currency spreads. We haven't even spoken about currency spreads. Yeah. So, you know, currency will play a role as well. So there are a whole lot of factors. And then over and above that, there's supply and demand issues at various points in time. So, you know, if there's a lot of... Uh, demand in one direction that may have an impact on the spreads. Uh, whereas if the market's more neutral with both buyers and sellers operating in the market at a particular point in time, that's likely to compress spreads. So it's a function of a mul of, of multiple factors. Uh, question from Thomas. Do I think the tax-free savings cap will be raised from the current 500,000 lifetime? I do, um, but there's no rush because that cap is still, you know, even if you've been maxing out, you're still, what, 10, 11 years away. I think in time, Treasury may well raise that. You know, 500K is, is losing its importance. Uh, Robin, you're, you're asking two questions. I'll answer the second one quick uh, and then throw the first one out. Uh, building on, on, on ZAR strengthening, so let's take ZAR strength as a given. We can debate that, but let's say it is uh, just for purpose of the question. Could one look at uh, government bonds for a shorter three to five year period? I mean, short answer is yes, your logic is sound because the ZAR strengthening, means money is coming into the country. Some of that will go to equity. Some of it will go to bonds. Remember that going into the bonds will push price up and yield down. Um, of course, the risk is that maybe we're wrong about the czar strength thing. The first half of your question was around, you know, offshore versus, you know, offshore via the JSC or practically taking money offshore uh, into the US. You do get a slight benefit if you take money offshore. Uh, you then need to have, because you don't pay the, there's no profit on the currency move if you're invested in dollars. Uh, your challenge, however, then is that you've now got assets offshore and that has probate issues around estates. In an ideal world, you would want a, a separate will and you're going to have uh, estate duties in the US as well, which will obviously come through and have implications. A, a, a couple of questions coming through, uh, Kingsley, and I'm going to sort of merge them together. Is it, you know, are there pension funds and, and, and Regulation 28 funds, which are, are, are investing into uh, passive product? And the answer is we are starting to see that uh, pick up. You've got to shop around, but, but certainly we've got Regulation 28 funds, which are using uh, a, a passive as their underlying investments. Yeah, absolutely. We run many institutional mandates uh, for for clients, uh, large balanced funds or components within a balanced fund. And certainly, uh, you know, pension funds will utilize some of the building blocks that I've mentioned today. The, the ones that they typically will use will be MSCI World and MSCI Emerge, Emerging Markets. Some, some uh, clients will just want the developed market exposure. 
Uh, others will be happy to have the ACQUI exposure, so both developed and emerging market exposure together. Um, but they tend to go, you know, institutional investors tend to go for the broad uh, exposure available uh, that, that MSCI offers. Um, yeah, yeah, so that's just to give you a feel of that. A uh, question coming through. Uh, after the iShares has paid their distribution, how long before that reflects into the Satrix feeder fund? I, I imagine it's happening pretty much uh, same day. No, so iShares, the, the, the iShares fund that we feed into doesn't distribute either. Yeah. So, so they also wrapped up, gotcha. So, so, so they reinvest the dividends from the companies they receive and they will do that pretty much as and when they receive them or as soon as they're available to be reinvested. Sometimes there can be a long uh, delay mm -hmm. uh, between when a company declares a dividend versus when it's actually paid. But as soon as that uh, dividend is available to be spent, uh, you know, the iShares ETF will reinvest that into the fund itself. So our ETF will never receive a distribution from the iShares fund we hold because iShares have reinvested those dividends themselves. So it's actually instantaneous because it's happening on, on their end. Uh, Zach, you're asking best exactly. portfolios to invest in in this period of COVID-19. Uh, this is not a glib answer, but I'm investing during the pandemic as I was investing before the pandemic and as I will post. And that's because if you've got a robust long-term investment strategy, um, you, 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 know, you, you accept that things are going to happen. Global financial crisis of 12 years ago, the dot-com bust uh, of 2000, the emerging market crisis of 98 and so on and so on. Um, so I don't change my strategy uh, as circumstances, my strategies it's taken a pounding. Well, it did, and then it recovered. But it, it you know, we, we, you need that robust strategy. Elis, you're asking pension funds, can you deposit funds into your pension beside your salary, i.e. extra funds from a bonus or something? Absolutely, you can. Uh, you can certainly put my extra money in. You could do it discretionary uh, onto a tax-free, but there's nothing stopping you putting extra money in. It doesn't just have to be that relationship with the monthly sort of deposit. Um, and we have made it through the questions. We've also hit our time, so I'm going to park it there. Um, ladies and gents, really appreciate your time this evening. There was over 200 of you in the event. Uh, some great questions coming through. Thank you very much. Uh, Kingsley Williams, Satrix CEO, sorry, CIO, uh, stealing uh, uh, Helena's title there for a second. Uh, Kingsley, really appreciate. Great presentation uh, and appreciate the help with the Q&A afterwards. Thank you very much, Simon, and thank you to everyone who joined. Yep, everyone, have a good evening. I was going to say travel safe, but you're probably at home. Stay safe, wash your hands. Cheers, all.